The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. I was drafted January 2nd, 1966 in Lacropal County. In September of 1966, we left for Vietnam. I spent 13 months there. Anyone in that period of time that would be 67, 68, uh, you were going to Vietnam, that was the, the big push. So that was, uh, I was assured of that, and I knew that the whole time I was in the military that that was a high uh, likelihood, so that's where I ended up. I was 19 when I enlisted. I was 21 when I went to Vietnam, so I was actually an old man compared to the average age of 19. I was with the Charlie Company, the Second Airborne Battalion, First Brigade, First Air Cavalry Division. We were the first division uh, that came out of Fort Benning, Georgia, out of the 11th Airborne. Uh, first operation, and I got there right at the end of the uh, in '68, right at the end of the uh, Tet Offensive thing. And, uh, over 75 percent of the South Vietnam was taken over by the communists during the Tet. I came there just after what was called the biggest offensive in Vietnam, Tet Offensive. It was the time when the North Vietnamese geared up with all the weapons they had and all the people they had, and they made an assault on the bases that the American soldiers were holding and protecting in, in Vietnam. So it, it was their big push to try to wipe us out. Many of the terrorists attempted to hide. The soldiers found them and brought them out. In a few areas of Saigon, the enemy seized and held the upper floors of tall buildings. Tanks were immediately deployed to these areas to help dislodge the Viet Cong. The enemy used his elite troops to attempt the capture of the Saigon radio station. Times, however, have changed. The loss of thousands of men and weapons has taught the communist general a grim lesson. I was in the army. I was drafted. Uh, I had a draft number of like 40-something. I think it was 42. Went to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky for basic training. Fort Landowood, Missouri for AIT training as a training man, as a field wireman. Then I got orders to go to Vietnam. I enlisted in 1968. I uh, left Marietta in July and went to San Diego, California. 1972, uh, we got to go on a joyride <laughs> on the Kitty Hawk and went over to Vietnam. The mammoth Kitty Hawk, second largest of U.S. attack carriers, turns into the wind to launch its airborne striking force.
It was hot, really hot, because it felt like somebody had turned the furnace on when I opened the door in the airplane. I heard one guy said it was like walking in from heaven into hell. It felt that hot. When I got drafted, I was actually working for East McQuodak Company, and I'd been there long enough so that each month they would give me four rolls of movie film or slides if I wanted and so. I wound up with about 20 rolls of movie film and uh, 20 uh, sets of slides. The fact that I had a Super 8 camera there, very few of the guys had a camera. I wasn't that great of a photographer, but I enjoyed uh, you know, taking, the, taking the movies. In six months, I was an old timer. I was one of those uh, guys in the company, in the battalion that had been around long enough, six months, to have more wisdom, more experience, more uh, uh, ability at this point to survive. What most people remember when you, once you get there in the jungle or rice paddies is the smell. It's hot, humid, and there is a particular smell to that place that you never get out of your system. Somebody could release some air from over there right now and I'd know where it came from. You know, it came from Vietnam or that part of the Southeast Asia. I went out on some alert missions of long-range recon patrols where you get in the chopper and go out with enough food for 72 hours, usually three to five-man teams. And you, uh, you try to locate the enemy, like a base camp or whatever, and the object is not to be seen. You just valued your time there and you didn't really know how much time you had. You just kind of figured, I may not be coming home. We shoot, I don't know how many rounds we shot, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rounds, thousands maybe. and. Uh, we never ever saw anything we got, you know, shot at. You just went out there and did your job every day, uh, whether you were in a war zone or not. You don't really think too much about all the dangers of being in a war zone, really. It's just doing your job. Well, it kind of goes in your mind, is this not the end of the world for me or what? I mean, the first time I went out on a convoy, we went out there and they had those banana leaves and all that stuff out there. It's kind of like a little unnerving. It's like the unknown. You risk your life every day. It was hot and muddy and dirty, or it was hot and dusty and muddy and dirty. Every day you just had to, you were covered with sweat and dust and mud and it was, uh, it was pretty intense, yeah. The heat and humidity was very intense. When I got there, I weighed 175 pounds, and when I left, I weighed 145. I lost 30 pounds over there, just from sweating it off, so to speak. So yeah, pretty intense.
Yeah, you were, you took a pair of uh, uh, fatigues or, you know, and just cut them off. And we wore them that way. Hardly ever wore a shirt. You can see a lot of the pictures we'll have. They were just hot. And then when they got the monsoon season, it rained. You know, it rained all the time. You always found yourself, at least I did, and I'm guessing most did, in a place that there weren't enough answers. There just was not enough answers. We weren't mature enough or uh, experienced enough to kind of process that stuff. We'd go out on a lot of missions to pick up helicopters. I never, unlike a sniper, I never went out with the idea of killing somebody. I went out with the idea I was going to come back that day. And if somebody had to die in the process, I was going to try to make sure it wasn't me. You know, that's how we lived. We, we became semi-animals, you know, survival. Tunnels, experienced the tunnels. I did not personally go down in one of those things. I was so relieved that I was bigger than most of the guys. Because it was always the littlest guy who went down the tunnel. I was, they just amazed me that they would even do that. Zimmerman, my friend that was machine gunner, he was KIA, and, and uh, we had uh, we had over 90 percent casualties uh, of the 154 men that were there. I mean, wounded, you know, a lot of wounded, and uh, we took heavy casualties, nine out of ten. So I was the only survivor out of out of that fire team, and um, then uh, you know it bothers you even after 50 years. It taught me to appreciate life because it can be jerked away. I, I've witnessed it being taken. It has a deep, deep uh, sensitive place in my whatever it is you call it my memory my psyche my who I am uh, the measure of life lost was and it happened uh, often it happened too often. Uh, never got numb. Never got. Never got easy. Tony, this is Tuan Victor. He's got it clean. There's nobody left alive down there. Schoolhanger, schoolhanger. This is Covey. Do you read? Then one other time, we were in a firefight, and I had a picture of my my daughter that had been born. And I was on the machine gun, and uh, I went to reload it with a belt, and I reached over to put a new 200-round belt in it, and my daughter's uh, uh, picture, it was only a day old, the first picture was a Polaroid, you know, my wife had sent it to me. And this round went, just as I moved, I moved, he squeezed off, and he hit the bottom of my pocket and missed me, but he ripped my shirt, the bottom of my shirt pocket, picture of my daughter fell out. 
I uh, picked it up and uh, put it, uh, grabbed it, I think, put it in one of my pockets. I rescued it anyway, and I moved back and got, you know, behind a, a tree in the jungle, got out of the clearing a little bit. But that, I, I would say that was close. Yes, they gave me a radio, um, they called me an RTO, which is a radio telephone operator. But my job as an RTO was to communicate with the head radio operator and the other um, operators in the other platoons. The real clinker of that part, the part that was tough, was that we knew that the one man they wanted to kill was the captain, and I'm right behind him and of course would like to wipe out the communications unit for, for the whole outfit. So that was a difficulty to be in RTO. But the jungle was somebody else's place, not ours. Man, uh, the jungle was just what, you know, what you imagine. It was just thick. It was just, it just took over the world. We would wait around until they had an assignment for us. They may load us up on, on Hueys, we call them, which were helicopters, and then they'd fly us into what we would call a fire zone or a zone that was on fire. And that's where you uh, just jump from the helicopter, you got your pack on your back and rifle, and you got your helmet on your head, and you run into the woods. And a lot of times that area had been cleared by what we call today Agent Orange. And that's where a lot of people ran into Agent Orange. I did myself. Yes, uh, I was exposed to Agent Orange. Um, I've got like three out of the many symptoms uh, of Agent Orange, so I'm, I'm classified as disabled due to the uh, symptoms of Agent Orange. In the Iron Triangle, yes, uh, we've seen the planes spraying, and um, of course, up pushing jungle, I'm sure that I was underneath that stuff. And then, luckily, I haven't uh, had cancer or anything, and I've actually led a pretty healthy life. I remember seeing them spraying that stuff with a helicopter around uh, Da Nang, but we didn't think that maybe they're spraying insecticide. We didn't know what it was. I got sprayed. Most of us there did. The spray planes would come on the base, you know, drip and then shot up, and we'd go over and help, see if we could help them fix it or whatever, you know. And we were around that stuff, and I know when we're out in the, the grass and stuff, or by a tree line, I know they'd spray the tree lines, you know, because we'd be there working, a couple of days later we'd come back and there was nothing there, so we know they'd been sprayed. And they say it's going to take seven generations for that Agent Orange stuff to get out of your system. I was uh, final checker on the flight deck and I'd have to go up to the flight deck two hours before first flight and I would do the final check on the aircraft checking all the avionics. We'd launch every hour and recover every hour so the plane was out during that hour. Then the pilot would come back and I'd have to uh, get the, uh, how the aircraft performed. Part of the time, we were testing the, uh, what was called a walleye bomb. It had a bomb with a, a camera on the front of it. And it was uh, the prelude to what we have now. It was our job. We didn't necessarily always agree with it. But we did it. Vietnam is about the size of Rhode Island. How come we couldn't overtake an enemy in a country that small in a much shorter time? I mean, uh, with the force that we have. The conditions in the mess all were, were terrible. You'd get a bowl of iced tea in a bowl, no cups, no ice, and a film of grease on it that the flies could walk across on. 
They said you shouldn't eat off base. I ate off base every chance I got. And the best French bread I've ever had has been in Vietnam. They would try to imitate like steak and french fries. Well, it was a piece of water buffalo steak, about a half inch thick and tougher than nails. But we ate it. Oh boy. <laughs> you know, it was mostly out of cans. And there was something called ham and line of a beans. And I swear to gosh, they put it in there to kill you. It was usually green, you know, and lima beans. Who in their mind wanted to eat lima beans? You know, I'm sorry, but that wasn't where you were. It got to the point where about the only ones we really liked was there was uh, beans and franks, which was pretty cool. And then there was another one, uh, spaghetti. And if it wasn't green, <laughs> it was pretty good. There was a ham and eggs that was always green. And then every once in a while, they'd have a can that had fruit in it peaches or pears sliced and we fought over those we didn't get them every time and we fought over them and also there was every once in a while a packet that was well packed in a sealed and sealed envelope and it was chocolate and this was supposed to be a real treat you get chocolate and uh that was the worst tasting chocolate i ever tasted in my life it was awful We started out using peanut butter to heat our coffee up with because it'd bend your stainless steel spoon if you tried to dig it out. And I didn't smoke cigarettes, but every C ration had four cigarettes in there, a small mini pack with four cigarettes. Anyway, there's one cigarette I opened up and I says to the master sergeant, I said, what's this? Uh, they say wing on them, wing cigarettes. He says, my God, those are World War II rations. He said, they... Uh, of course, C ration stands for combat ration, canned goods, you know. He says they went bankrupt in 1943, the Wing Cigarette Company did. Haven't seen those for a long time. So here I am in 1967 or whatever, eating a 1943 C ration, which is uh, 20, uh, 25 years old or something. <laughs> I spent a lot of time confused and determined to, to make it, that probably. Two, the two elements of uh, life in Vietnam was confusion and determination to survive. Just my regrets that so many young men didn't get to come home. That's the worst of it. Uh, I don't think that they died in vain, I really don't, because of the way the South Vietnamese people have turned out now. We've had a lot of wars uh, where things haven't turned out quite so well. I was proud to be there. I volunteered to go there. I volunteered for the Army. I wasn't drafted. And I don't regret going there. It was a heck of an experience. I wouldn't want to do it again. You know, and I don't wish anybody to have to do that, but it, it has to be done. We'd like more veterans to come to Project New Hope. There is nothing wrong with me, is what most of them tell you. Or I'm the only one with the problem, I don't want to bother anybody. I guess I would say that my experience in the Navy was uh, a very good experience. I, I wouldn't change any of it for, uh, I grew up in the Navy. VA-195 was a, was a good experience for me. You kind of wonder what happened. The time we spent there was pure chaos for everybody. Vietnamese and Americans, just all chaos. Now is it better? I hope so.